Hey guys, Lou Perez here with the Lou Perez Podcast. Um, you may recognize me from my work with We The Internet TV or Greg and Lou. And just so you know, this podcast is completely independent from those other projects. So I need your support. If you'd like to support me, um, go check me out on locals.com and join the Lou Perez community. Uh, this next episode, I had a really great time talking with Phil Labonte, who's the lead singer of All That Remains. We talked about metal, we talked about living in the woods, and we talked about how Phil might have to work on his tourniquet game. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time to to join me on this uh, this new venture that I have in, in podcasting. And uh, the first thing that I'll say is, uh, you and I met. Um, I think we connected over Twitter, uh, which yeah. is ver- which is very weird because it seems like Twitter normally is about dividing people. Like the amount of people, <laughs> like I'm just gonna uh, everybody that I used to follow, I no longer follow, and everyone who used to follow me <laughs> no longer follows me. But yet nice. somehow, in all that noise, you and I were able to uh, uh, to make this connection. So I don't know if. I don't know what you think about that, but I think that's pretty cool. Well, yeah, I, I think, I think you're right. Twitter, Twitter tends to amplify. um, I feel like unless you intentionally try to monitor what you're saying and, and, and measure your, your comments and stuff, Twitter tends to amplify the the more negative aspects of people. I know I I used to drink too much. I, I used to drink all the time. I I quit drinking completely uh, because it's better for me in in many ways. And my um, my Twitter experience has has been much more positive since one I quit drinking and two I started blocking people people that were intending to look for an issue. It's one thing to disagree with people, which is, it's easy to find people that you disagree with. Um, and I, I don't block people that I disagree with. I don't just say, Oh, well, I don't, I don't agree with that person. So I block them. It's, it's definitely, uh, more rhetorical tactics that I'll block people for, uh, the way that they present questions. If they, if they come to you looking for a, looking for a certain type of disagreement, that'll get a block real quick. But, but, um, and there are some people out there that, that I got some guy was criticizing me for it last night. Oh, well, you, I can't believe you blocked blah, blah, blah. This is pathetic. And it's like, look, man, I'm not obligated to give anyone my time. And that's, that's one of the things that I think if you're on Twitter, you should, you should remember you're in control of your feed. If you don't want to give someone your time, don't give it to them. If you don't want to give someone your attention, don't give it to them. Just take it away from them and walk away and don't let their, their poking and, and, and prodding and, and attempting to upset you and troll you and whatever. Don't let them, don't let that get to you because the second you block them, you might think about it and be mad for five, 10, 15 minutes. But as soon as you do something else and that goes away, that person that you never met, that you probably will never met, meet in real life, they go away too. So. Right. Well, it's an, I think that there's an interesting level of entitlement that, you know, sort of social media has given people. I, I spoke with, um, uh, Lionel Shriver, who's a who's a novelist, mm-hmm. and she has like you know over ten novels she's written, and she wrote a novel. Um, we need to talk about Kevin that was turned into like a, a movie. Like she's a successful writer, and you know with uh, it 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 seems to happen like with fans especially uh, because the way things now like they almost fans almost think that you owe them your time, and it's like and 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 she made the point. It's like no no, your time you know, my time is in this book that you read and you know, with you, like, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're a musician, you've been, you've had your band for, you know, for so many years, you have so many fans. It's almost like it used to be, Hey, if you want to, if you want to meet Phil, if you want to meet all the remains, you got to go to their show. You got to go to their show. You got to hang out. Maybe you guys do a meet and greet or something like that. But now, you know, a dude, whether they're a fan or not a fan, they could just slide into your DMS and say, Hey, look at me, man, you owe me this because you know, I'm an anonymous person on Twitter and I have a problem with uh, track 15 on your, uh, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah, it, it's definitely true. Um, and I try to remember that I, I, cause I, you know, I'm not looking to, to turn people off or, or looking to alienate people that are fans and stuff. Um, and with, you know, 
20 year career with a 20 year career and nine records and a lot of variety on our records and, and being a band that never wanted to be pigeonholed as this type of band or anything, you're going to get a lot of people that have a lot of opinions about a lot of things that you've done. And they feel like, I mean, everyone's the hero of their own story, you know, and uh, you can't fault. I can't fault anyone for that because that's exactly how I feel about my own life. And, and that's, that's a very normal thing. So I try to remember that when interacting with people, but at the same time, if they don't extend me the courtesy of being respectful at the very mm-hmm. least, you know, uh, I'll just, I, you know, I, sometimes I'll, sometimes I'll ignore them. Uh, sometimes I'll just block them. Sometimes, sometimes they need to be put on blast. That yeah. that's happened too. You know, there was a guy that, uh, worked for a f- pretty, f- a very, worked for an extremely famous person. And he saw, thought that because he worked for an extremely famous person that he d- had some kind of entitlement to my time. And he said something I didn't like. So I blocked him. And then he chased me to another platform and I blocked him there. And then he used his girlfriend's account or his wife's account or whatever wow to come after me. And I'm like, and I was like, okay, well now you get put on blast. And I put that up on the internet. I was like, look, if you get blocked in one place, don't chase me to another place. If you chase me to another place and then I block you there and then you go and get a third account to go ahead and let me know you disapprove, I'm going to make fun of you and I'm going to put you on the internet. Otherwise, you know, it's like the next step is him just showing up outside your door and doing like, you know, just knock, knock, knock. Like, Hey man, seriously, I really need to talk to you about this. I found that's um, that's a, that's a terrible uh, idea. Yeah. Um, um, do, do you find, uh, I, I find like, uh, like metal, like fans of metal are very like hard, you know, very hardcore, very devoted, very loyal. And uh, I found, I don't know if this was an example of just this dude I know, but uh, the band Tool recently uh, released an album after like 13 years. And yeah. um, uh, I listened to it once. It was like in the background, right? And, you know, I wasn't feeling it, right? So I listened to it once, mm-hmm. it was in the background. And then I went and I, uh, I posted something on Twitter. I, uh, I said, uh, I was playing around with like Tool. They, they do like these like kind of interesting titles and stuff like that. So sure, yeah. I put out a uh, Virtu signalization uh, means pretending the new Tool album is good. It's just me. <laughs> it's just me being, a, you know, just me being a dick. Just me just being a, a joke, dick. poking, yeah. Yeah. And this dude who I went to graduate school with, like, out of nowhere came and said, said, you know, Maynard will do more for humanity than you will <laughs> ever do. Right. More, yeah. But yeah, exactly. Like, like he will have more of an influence on humanity and he will be remembered and you will be forgotten. You will be forgotten, man. Uh, and then there were some other digs he had to throw in there about me being a libertarian. I'm not sure what the two had to, you know, had to do with one another. And all I could respond was, with, was, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I think Maynard, yeah, I think Maynard, you know, is it, it, good. Uh, and it's funny I mean, because I, my fr- my first thought when you said that is would would be to reply, well, yeah, well, so did Genghis Khan, but you know, that's not right. anything to be proud of, you know. I'm just so about, I, you know, now, 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 not, that, not, not that Maynard is Genghis Khan or anything. Right. But, all no, the little tool babies around, you know, around. But it, it, for me, it was it was it was very weird because I have I, I think I have a relationship with the band Tool in that uh, the, the 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 first two albums I ever bought were uh, Soundgarden, Super Unknown, and Tools, Undertow. Those are the first two albums I bought when I was a kid. I was like probably like sixth grade or something like that. Like, oh, what a, you know, what a cool kid. Um, and uh, actually, when I came around uh, and started listening to the new album, like, I really love it. Like, I really, I really love the new album. And uh, one song in particular, Numa, has just been like a, on a constant, constant repeat. But it was just like, man, you know, the idea that I wouldn't be able to make fun of something that I find important or allow other people to make fun of it. It's like, man, that's just a, that's a, for me, it's a little bit of a sad, sad existence. I think you're right. But I think again, I think that because of the platform, um, I mean, uh, so you, everyone's heard the old, and I mean, it, maybe it's not that old, but everyone knows you never read the comments, right? Any right. content creator knows you don't go to your YouTube page and read the comments. You don't go to this and read the comments because that's where people want to go ahead and one criticize and complain and 
two, they'll, they'll do that because they want to make jokes at your expense that other people will click like on. Mm -hmm. Twitter's the comment section for the whole internet. (laughs) So if you look at Twitter with, with that kind of perspective, it's like, you know, if you put something up there, someone's going to have a problem with it. Yesterday I put up a picture of, I, I, I'm a gun guy and, and uh, there's this thing that gun guys do called like a, a pocket dump or an EDC everyday carry all the stuff you carry. And I have, I have a, a, a little tourniquet. This is a, a called a rat's mm-hmm. tourniquet. They're not the best tourniquets out there. They're not the best option, but this is small enough to fit in my pocket. And so that means I can carry it with me without having to have a bag, without any stuff. It's just on me all the time. And a guy jumped in and he's like, those are bad and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, well, it's better than bleeding out in five minutes. Well, no, they're not better. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, all right, we'll block you. Because his, like his, he, his entire persona on Twitter was complaining about tourniquets. Now that seems really niche, right? That's really specific, yeah. but that's what the guy did. His name had something about tourniquets. His, his <laughs> name had something about certain tourniquets. And I'm just like, I don't want someone like you chasing me around complaining about what I have in my pocket. I, right? I, I'm just imagining that this guy like, you know, has a website with like the top 20 people you want to be shot around. And yeah. like, <laughs> you, and Phil, <laughs> Phil, you have not made that list, man. I like, know, right? Crap. You know, but I, I really think that, that that's, you know, there's someone out there that's going to have a boner for something you say. And the more pe- more followers you have and the more the more people you reach – the more likely you're going to find that that one person, the one dude, and to be fair, it's usually a dude when Mm -hmm. it comes to complaining about something, uh, something that you, you did. Women have a a different kind of neurosis that they exhibit on the internet from men. Uh, Men will tell you that the tools that you're using are wrong. They'll tell you this is wrong and that's wrong. And that thing shouldn't use that kind of hammer and you got to get a different kind of, you know, that kind of thing. Whereas women will do something different, but there's the, the larger your platform is, the more frequently you're going to bump into those people, especially mm-hmm. on a, on a platform like Twitter, which basically is just the comment section for the entire internet. Right. Right. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering, wondering, you know, you carrying around the tourniquet just made me think of, um, so I'm, I'm in New York city. Um, I don't, I don't own a gun. Um, although anyone who's watching this, just pretend that I do just don't, just don't mess with me. Um, and, uh, you, you know, so, you know, you carry around a tourniquet, you, you carry around, um, you know, um, a, a weapon. How do you handle, you know, sort of the day-to-day responsibility of that? Um, because, um, a lot of times when I hear people talking about, uh, talking about guns and I'm a very, uh, very pro gun person, very big defender of, uh, of people's right to, to bear arms. Um, I, I don't think they talk enough about, you know, sort of the gravity of it. You know, it's like, no, no, you're carrying around reality there yep. and, and everything that comes, uh, that comes around with it. You're taking like a huge responsibility. And actually when you said that you no longer drink, like, it's like, wow, that's, that's great. Especially if you are someone who carries, like, that's great yeah. being able to make that, make that decision. Yeah. Um, it is, it is a, a significant responsibility that I think people need to acknowledge. And one of the things, because I am, I'm a fairly high profile person, um, I make sure that I don't just talk the talk, right? Like I don't just, I'm not the guy that's just showing guns off and shooting like on my stream. Anytime, anytime guns come up on my, on my Twitch stream, I go through the four basic firearm safety rules every time. And anytime I want to show a gun, I show that it's clear, you know, I, and I let my, my chat see, and I make sure that I go to at least one class, one uh, training class per year, every year. And I put a video of me at the class so that people see that I'm actually, you know, I'm actually walking the walk. I don't just talk the talk. Um, and I try to temper my talk about guns with the reality of carrying a gun, like you said, like, so I, you know, I put up the, I put up the everyday carry thing partially because I could, so I could show off these things. This is just a shrink wrapped or a vacuum sealed gauze and a tourniquet. You should be able to, to use these. If you can shoot a gun, if you carry a gun, you should have these with you You, because putting holes in things Mm. is, is, is far easier than stopping people from bleeding out 
And so these kind of things are every bit as important as, you know, carrying a, a gun for self-defense. You're, you're far more likely to need those than you are to actually need your gun because those right there can help if you happen upon a, uh, a car accident and someone's mm-hmm. got an arterial bleed. Um, you know, someone could be walking down the street and, you know, someone, a car almost hits them. They jump through, you know, they jump and they bash into the window, into a window, the window breaks, and then they've got an arterial bleed. You know, like those kind of things are, are far more likely than having to use your gun to defend your life. So mm-hmm. I try to, to remind people that having a mindset of, of self-defense and self-preservation comes with a mindset of, of saving other people's lives and being prepared to be a helper. Mm-hmm. The point of having a gun isn't just you know, it's not just, it's not like just being some kind of tough guy. You want to be a helper. You want to be able to help people. Um, and that's, that, that, at least that's the way that I look at it. So there's a lot of things that go along with it and, and having, you know, this kind of stuff that I can carry on my person or, you know, I have a backpack that I carry that has a far more involved, uh, you know, trauma kit as well as a boo-boo kit which is I get a whole lot more use out of my boo-boo kit than I do out of my, uh, Thank God. Uh, you know, I've never, I've never had to use, use either of these, but I tell you what, I've made sure that people weren't going to bleed all over the interior of my car more than once mm-hmm. because I had, you know, some band-aids and, and some, some, you know, Neos. Neosporin. Oh, I think you, you, um, you paused, uh, you, uh, you're, pr- on pause. What, what? There we go. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. The internet connection is unstable. These kind of things. Oh, there know, we go. I carry this stuff. I carry this stuff with me uh, in my uh, in my bag all the time because they're very very useful. You know? Yeah. And and it it's important. In my opinion, it's important to be able to help people if you can. Yeah. It. it um, what really did it for for me when it comes to just like you know being prepared and. Uh, the responsibility of of all that is my wife and I, we had a, we had a baby in March oh. and uh, I think it was probably like a month leading up to his birth. We went to one of those, uh, you know, CPR classes in, in particular mm-hmm. with the baby C, with the baby CPR stuff. And uh, if, if anyone's ever been to the class, they know what it looks like. There's just like a pile of little dolls that are supposed to be babies. And, you know, uh, and we had a we had a the teacher there who was um, trying to push her version of dark humor, which I I wasn't ready for. Uh, I was like, nah, <laughs> I, I, I don't need I, I don't need uh, you, you to be joking about you know my child potentially uh, choking or their heart stopping or anything like that. It was very it was it was very annoying. But you know, going through the class and working on that, it was there were two things like, oh, holy shit this could actually happen and holy shit i it's on me to be responsible and try to stop the worst thing that could that could possibly happen so it was sort of you know not only my shitting myself because of becoming a parent for the first time but also it's like oh, th- this little kid's life is really in my hands and yeah, uh, I, yeah. The, the, there's one, that's one thing that that going to classes uh training classes really drives home um, you're, you're dealing with reality. And I, I see people that are unfamiliar with guns and unfamiliar with violence in general, um, how violence actually happens in the real world. Um, everyone loves to say, oh, well, I'll shoot him in the leg. Or why didn't you shoot him in the leg? Mm-hmm. Well, if you shoot him in the leg, the chances are you're, if you, if you actually manage to hit them, uh, in, in, in their leg, chances are you're probably going to blow their artery out anyways, and, uh, they're going to bleed out. So that it's just as deadly to shoot someone in the leg as it is to shoot them. It's actually more deadly to shoot someone in the leg than it is to shoot them in the lung, because you can, you'll last a whole lot longer with one lung than you will with, with your, your artery in your leg pumping out all your blood. Cause that's, that's as big as the arteries get. Um, people don't understand that, that violence happens really, really fast. Uh, if you're if you are in a violent situation, the person that gets the most violent, the fastest, usually wins. Which is is why you you know you don't wait for someone to punch you mm-hmm. uh, if if you if you know and you know the signs because there are tells that people give when they're they're looking to uh, you know initiate a violent contact uh, or a violent interaction. 
if you know the signs, you don't have to wait for someone to punch you. You can be like, all right, I need to leave. I need to get out of here. I need to move. I need to get myself away from that guy because that guy is doing this. And, and when you go to these classes, you know, those are the kind of things that you learn on top of, you know, shooting because shooting like marksmanship, just ping, 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 hitting the target, you know, putting holes in paper. That is the very, very, very basic, easy, fundamental, can learn it in an afternoon thing that you learn when it comes to guns. All the other stuff around it that that goes with with carrying a gun and stuff, that's what you get in training classes. And there's another thing that bothers me that I want to point out. Sorry to, to go on, but this is, oh, no, this is something I think is really important. Um, people say, I want, you know, I, I worry about who gets guns and I want people to be trained and da-da-da. And I do too. I agree. I want people to be trained. I personally, I have my fingerprints and my, my passport photo on file with the ATF because of some of the stuff that I own. I've had more background checks than I can, can count. Uh, I go to classes every year. I'm former military. I'm the guy that you want to have a gun. Like when people say, I, this is the kind of person I want to have a gun, I check all the boxes. I've done all the stuff. Then when those same people see what you, you actually do in a, in a class, they, they kind of get green around the gills and squirmy and, oh, I don't know if I like that. I don't want people learning that stuff. And it's like the safety aspect of carrying a gun is very simple and you can be taught it in an hour. And it really boils down to the four basic firearm safety, uh, safety rules. You, you never point a gun at anything that you're not willing to destroy. You, keep, uh, you, you need to know what's in front of and behind your target and all around your target at all times. Um, treat every gun as if it's loaded right. and you keep your finger straight and off the trigger until you're on target ready to fire. Those are the safety rules. If you follow the safety rules, you never have a problem. That can be drilled into someone and, and learned very quickly. When you go to a class and the instructor says, okay, when I give the command, I want you to put two in the heart and two in the head, and then I want you to blah, blah, blah. And people that have never seen a, 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 a gun class hear things like two in the heart, two in the head. They're like, whoa. Right. What do you think you're going to train for when you go to train with a gun? You know, what is it you think that you're, you're doing? Do you think that it, they're spending all day long reminding you, don't point at anyone, don't point at anyone, don't point at anyone. Don't, that, that's not how it goes. You're training for realistic situations. And just like you said earlier, the gravity of what's going on kind of hits you. This is real. These things could happen. And what you're doing is trying to prepare for these things should they happen to you or to someone you love. Yeah, so. I think I think a lot of, uh, I mean, is there, you know, a better time in recent memory to be giving, for people to be getting a, a, a reality-based lesson in what Just violence yesterday. is, today. right? Yeah, yeah. what, what was the one yesterday? What was the one yesterday? Best, the, the only better time. I, I just, I'll, I'll the only better earlier. Any, yeah, yesterday, <laughs> the day before that, the day before that, just, just right, before right. now, like if you're getting it now, great. The yeah. only time better was yesterday. And the only time better than that was the day before. Yeah. Yeah. Because the, the, the stuff that, the stuff that I've been seeing, and one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is, uh, you know, as, as libertarians, there's often this, uh, this idea that if you're a libertarian, you are anti-cop 100%. It doesn't matter what the cop does. They are agents yeah. of the state. Therefore they do not fall under the same, uh, you know, uh, the same guidelines as you would, uh, as you would anyone else. And, you know, there, there was a, there was a time, I think when I was very much, uh, anti, uh, anti-cop. Um, and no matter what happened, I was always, you know, sort of like, well, screw them. They're, you know, they're agents of the state and, and that's it. And then what I found is I just started, um, seeing more and more lies, I think, about uh, interactions with police, uh, especially with video being released and all that, just like as a general as a general thing. And I'm like, wait a minute, you know, uh, you can have problems with, uh, I want to end the drug war, I want to end qualified immunity, I want to end no-knock yeah. raids, I want to end all that. But that doesn't mean I have to, uh, say, defend a, uh, a suspect who is charging a police officer with a knife and say that that isn't a justifiable... Um, uh, kill. Uh, so, uh, and, and I, and I, I've been, anyone who's, who's been following you on, on Twitter, I think it, you do a very good job of pointing out, um, what should be obvious to people when it comes to, uh, self-defense in moments of, you know, when we law enforcement are involved. 
I have a lot of thoughts on this. <laughs> so no, I love to, yeah, love to if I go it. too long or whatever, but don't be afraid to cut me off. But oh, sure. um, first of all, I think we're talking about a distinction between libertarians and anarchists. And I, ideologically, I love the idea of anarcho-capitalism, right? The idea of a stateless society where everybody behaves voluntarily and there is a means to handle uh, aggression, whether that be physical aggression or uh, you know lying to people and and you know lying in contracts and stuff, there are theoretical ways that I've heard people talk about um, that are compelling, and I really love the idea. I really, really do, and I really wish that I thought that it was possible, but I don't, um, and that's why I, I'm I'm. I consider myself probably a minarchist, uh, which is like a constitutionalist. It's similar. Um, oh, yeah. If any, if anybody's interested, I was on um, You're Welcome with Michael Malice. He's <laughs> so, great. So he's he great. He's I, the I, best. I, I love, I him love Michael. And uh, let's just say that, that he um, uh, destroyed me. I think yeah. on the on, on the topic of he's like, so why are you a minarchist? And I'm like, I don't know. And and he's like, well, what what's the subject that that gets you? I'm like, I don't know, policing. And then and then afterward, uh, the the guy who does tech forms, like, yeah, man, when he asked you that, I was just saying, please God, don't say policing, please God, don't say, <laughs> don't say policing. But you know, I, I think I think he shellacked me, he kicked my ass. But it you know, it's something where I I, I am um, totally open to learning more about it. And, you know, for, and one thing I, I could say about all my anarchist friends, they are principled as fuck. Yes, like they, they are, are they, you know, they are there no matter what is happening. They are principled uh, as fuck. But, um, and I have tons of respect for, I have, I have a ton of anarchist friends and I have a ton of respect for them too. They know the arguments in and out. Um, but I think in reality, and I think that we've seen it uh, with what's gone on in, in the Pacific Northwest, I think in reality, you don't end up with an, an, uh, ANCOM or an anarcho capitalist situation. You end up with the chop or the chaz or whatever you want to call it. You end up with warlords. You end up with, uh, you know, that dude that was handing out a ARs from the back of his, his, uh, you know, the yeah, back a, of his, a his warlord car. who's a rapper and also yeah. uh, apparently has some Airbnb properties. If, uh, yeah, if you're interested you know. in that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and, and again, ideologically, I love it and I'm very open to the arguments and, and I get that people are, are passionate about it. And, and if you approach me with the, with the arguments in a friendly manner, I will listen and I will respect your arguments. Uh, but I, I still I don't think that it'll work. Um, and I think that, you know, history has shown that it won't work. It, if the constitution can't, can't limit government, and there's an argument to be made that the constitution has failed to limit our government, considering we have the biggest government in all of human history. So there's a, a compelling argument uh, to be made that, that, the constitution doesn't limit government and that you can't limit government. If that's the case, I don't see any compelling evidence that an, a truly anarchist society with property rights is, is possible either. Um, power tends to consolidate. Um, and so, excuse me. So I don't know that it's realistic when it comes to policing. One of the things that, that people that are anarchists, that don't, you know, the ACAB anarchists, um, they tend to throw out the humanity of the police themselves. So like, as long as the police officer is trying to get someone to comply and do something, right? And that person is resisting, as long as they're not resisting and, and fighting, they're just not listening, fine. I, I, the arguments for nonviolence and, and blah, 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 they're all legit. As soon as it turns into a physical confrontation, and this goes back to the reality of, of, of violence and carrying guns and stuff. If I have my gun on me, there is no fight that's just a fist fight. Every fight, every interaction that could be considered a fight I have to assume is a fight over my gun. Mm -hmm. So if someone tries to punch me or tries to hit me, it is not reasonable to expect me to respond with punches. Because if you hit me and you 
daze me, then my gun could be taken and I could be killed. Same thing goes for a police officer. If you go and put hands on a police officer, that police officer stops being just a police officer. It's a person with the same right to defend their life that you have. And if you, and I, I, I hate to say this, and I know that there's going to be people that are going to hate this because I don't want to say just comply. But as soon as you turn it into a physical confrontation, it's a physical confrontation over that gun. Mm-hmm. And people neglect to acknowledge that, that the police officer is a human being and that if the person, the police officer is trying to get to comply, attacks the police officer, it doesn't matter that the police officer is an agent of the state. It's a human being with a gun that has to make sure that the other human being doesn't incapacitate them because if they do incapacitate them, they can get the gun and kill them. You know, I, I wonder how much, of, like, I'm, I'm 38 years old, and I'm from New York originally, uh, Queens, and my parents have a, a business in Spanish Harlem, and, uh, you know, so I've, I've, I live in Brooklyn right now, and I don't know if I'm, if I'm just of a generation where I grew up knowing if I put my hands on a cop, I'm going to get fucked up, like, whether it's by that cop or a group of cops when they have me cuff, they're <laughs> going to fuck me up. Or that cop and all his friends. Yeah, yeah exactly. And you know, I'm, and uh, you know, and, and it's, it's, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't say that just as like a, a, as a joke, but, but just sort of as a, as a reality of the streets, if you will. My father uh, is a, is a business owner and uh, years back um, he, he's kind of like semi-retired now years back. Mm-hmm. There was an inst- there was a situation in his store where a police officer chased a suspect into the store, right? And the police officer was loud and cursing and blah, 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 and all that. And my dad told him, don't curse in my store, right? And the cop said, uh, oh, what do you, the cop said something about, what are you protecting this piece of shit or something like that? And then my dad said, well, 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 arrest him. If you don't arrest him, then you're on his payroll or something like that. It was, it was a fight. This is second, you know, Second, third, third hand storytelling. Um, and at some point, uh, my dad was handcuffed and um, he said that they were very rough with him, right? They pulled his arm back and, and stuff like that. And I hear that. I hear my dad's been roughed up by a cop. I feel really, really upset about it. But then what my dad reveals is that he had smacked the cop in the face at some point in the store. And even though they they they, they He's tweaked lucky my he didn't get shot. No, dude. Even though they tweaked my dad's <laughs> arm, right? According to my dad, it's like no, those are the fucking rules. Like I put my hands on him, and he yeah. has to regain not only the respect of of my dad, but also the respect of the people around him. Yeah. And it's something where you know that situation. It's like let's leave the theoretical. Let's let's leave all that. It's the reality of the street where, yeah. you know, and, and that's just what you're dealing with. Yeah. The, I mean, the reality of violence, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, and the way that people react to people, um, New York's got some real, I, I personally think New York probably has some really bad days ahead of it for, mm-hmm. for a while, because I don't see a lot of people in New York, uh, lining up to be cops. And if you don't have good people, people that care about the community, people that want to be good police officers lining up, you'll end up with people that just want to get money and, and want to get paid or will call, think of, think of it as a cool way to, to be in power. And you end up with bad cops. You end up with not enough cops. Uh, I, I, have, I have very serious concerns for what's going to happen to New York City in the coming decades. You know, probably, it's probably going to take yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if New York were on a had a had a significant uptick in crime for the next ten years until they could they can really kind of get it sorted. Oh, I totally you know? I totally agree. My my wife and I are are looking to to go to the suburbs, and yeah. you know it, that there's that saying where you know it takes a village to raise a child, and it's like, well, if you believe it takes a village to raise a child, you better be really fucking careful on who you allow in your village. And yeah, kind of what absolutely. I'm, you know, what I'm seeing in New York as a lifelong New Yorker are a bunch of people who don't give a shit about me, who don't give a shit about yeah. my well-being. 
you know, the type mm-hmm. of people who are going to find a find an excuse, a justification if shit comes down on me. You know, if 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 my my property is destroyed, well, we have a reason for that. It's systemic. If I get fucked up in the street, well, we have a reason for that. It's systemic. If I call the cops and they can't come and and, and help, well, it's just they're going to find a justification to yeah. it, you know for anything that happens to me. And I've I've sort of I've described it where uh, my relationship with New York is like I've been all around the world. I've eaten I've eaten at Michelin star restaurants, and then I come back to New York, and New York is serving me a plate of shit. <laughs> and expecting me to be thankful for it and then also leave a big tip on top of that. Yeah. And I'm just like, no, man, I, I'd, like, I'd like to live in a neighborhood where like, people pick up their trash and like, yeah. maybe have a lawn or something like that. <laughs> I, uh, I moved to the woods um, in 2011. I moved to New Hampshire. Or, yeah, 2011, I moved to New Hampshire from Western Massachusetts. And there were multiple reasons. Um, I'm very close to Western Mass still. It's only about an hour because of the highway that's here. I can jump on the highway real quick and get down to where my, my, you know, my sister lives with my nephews and my mom still lives down there and the band practice is there and, and it's very easy for me. But I moved away to another state for a reason. Um, back then it was... It was ha ha ha. Phil's the guy that lives out in the woods. In the woods, you know, yeah, very much in the woods. I I bought a I I moved to New Hampshire, like I said in 2011. I bought my house in 2013, and my house is on a 48. I have 48 acres, and my house is in the back of the 48 acres. It's not on the street. My driveway is seven tenths of a mile long. You know, you don't accidentally to onto my front lawn. You know, you you don't you don't. Whoops! I didn't mean to show up here. Um, I'm, I'm in a one bedroom apartment with my wife and baby. And so I don't know, I don't know how many acres that is. How many that's, point, that's pr- <laughs> point, point zero, 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 zero. Point zero, zero, two is probably close yeah. to, <laughs> um, but yeah. And I, I, and I, I, I took friendly ribbing from my friends that are, cause obviously being in the music industry, I have a lot of friends in, in, you know, in the city and in, in LA and, and, you know, I've been all over the world myself and stuff. So I've taken ribbing and, and taken jokes and always good hearted and stuff. Oh, Phil, the blah, 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 the guy, you got a, you got a, a, a bunker out there yet? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Well, this year, a whole lot of people look at my decision very differently. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I, I wasn't thinking this is, you know, any specific thing is going to happen. Uh, I just knew that I wanted to be away from the crowded situations in cities and suburbs. Um, and, uh, I don't regret doing it. It's definitely been full of far more hassle than if I lived in a city. Um, you know, Postmates doesn't come to my place. Um, I have to drive a half an hour to go to the gym. The, the, the Postmates uh, was, must be like, dude, it's a trap. There's no way, <laughs> there's no way somebody lives out of here who doesn't wish to, to eat us or something like that. Yeah, I, I, I would be amazed if they, if they made it up my driveway. Like I said, it, with a driveway that long, I expect people to get about halfway up and then be like, I'm, I'm definitely in the wrong spot. I'm totally yeah. in the wrong spot. I have to turn around, you know. Right. Um, and, and yeah, you know, they're all of the cool things that my friends, you know, would talk about, uh, or people that don't know where I live will be like, well, don't you have blah, blah, blah. I'm like, man, I ain't even got cable at my house. What? Blah, blah, blah. You know, um, you know, but, but it's, it's, it's definitely something that you know, I don't regret it at all. And, and I think that, that having a balance between privacy and access to modernity, uh, is something that, more people are taking, uh, taking seriously and, and, and looking at, uh, you know, for, for, again, for me, 10 years ago, I was like, I want to live in the woods. So I wouldn't now I, w- I understand why you're moving from the city to the suburbs. But if I were in the suburbs, I would definitely be looking to get the f- heck out of the suburbs, you know? Um, but, uh, but again, that's, 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 that's just me. Um, Do you, I wonder, you know, cause you've been, you know, you've had your, your band, uh, or, doing music and you know one incarnation or another i know you band been through a lot of like, different members and all that is it one of those things where i feel like you have so many people who kind of have like a fear of missing out 
where they're like, no, I got to be in the city because this is where things are happening, blah, blah, blah. Where I wonder, I mean, you've toured all over the world. You've performed in front of, you know, adoring audiences and stuff like that. Does that give you like sort of the ability to be like, hey, you know what? I can get some solitude. I I could deal with some solitude away from all that stuff because I've been, I've had it. I'm an introverted guy. Um, There, you know, there, as much as I I do have a presence on the internet and, uh, you know, I can get on stage and stuff, there is a distinct barrier between me and what people see in public um, and the way that people perceive me. Um, and it's not intentional. It's not like I'm, 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 I'm probably the most authentic rock star that you're going to find out there. Um, or at least as authentic as any other, uh, rock star that you would consider authentic. I'm, I don't, I'm not the guy that puts on airs. I mean, Look, I'm wearing a hoodie and a, t- and a, and a ball cap. You're you know, not wearing I'm, sunglasses inside. Yeah, so that, I know, think that says something about you right there. <laughs> there, I, there was one time, I'm not going to say the, the artist's name because I don't want to sling mud, but there was this one time a big artist that uh, I was doing a photo shoot with me and a, few, a bunch of other people. And we, he made everybody wait. And there were, there were other people that were big name artists as well in, on, in this photo shoot. And he made everybody wait. And he sh- like, hours we were probably waiting for him for two maybe three hours and couldn't really do stuff without him um and then he shows up and he takes a handful of pictures and he's super nice to everybody that's an artist right makes makes it a point to turn around shake everyone's hand look you in the eye say thank you hey i'm sorry nice to meet you blah 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 super nice and yet when it came to anyone else aside from the artists he was kind of a jerk. He was definitely a dick to his, his assistants, had a glass of wine, finished it, smashed the glass of wine on the ground just cause that ain't me. Right. <laughs> that is, that is so far away from me. Uh, you know, and it shocked me that, that he, he behaved like that. Cause I'd never seen that in real life. And I, you know, I heard stories, but I, I thought they were all kind of just people making stories up. Yeah. It's, yeah. It sounds like somebody's like, okay, this is, um, you know, we're casting for a stereotypical rock star. Yeah. Uh, we're going to, we're going to need you to destroy this hotel room for no reason. And, uh, and, and all that. I, <laughs> yeah. Right out of central casting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was just sort of what I found, uh, uh, you know, the difference between like, doing like comedy and music, um, just to let you know, I was, uh, I was in a band in middle school. All right. Ah. So yeah, we were never able to find a singer, uh, which is really stupid of me because we should just let the guy, the other guitar player sing because he went on to do a lot of stuff in music. He was actually great, but I, I, I miss the, I miss the boat on that. Uh, but one of the, one of the, one of the things that I've noticed the difference between like comedy and music, uh, a buddy of mine, was doing a, a late night comedy show at the, the bitter end in the village in, in New York. And, you know, we would wait for like the bands to be done. And then we'd get up and try to do comedy while the bands are like, you know, sort of schmoozing with, uh, with people. And it's like, I think one of the great things about music is like, you can be in a shitty band and still get laid. Whereas like, <laughs> like if you're a comedian and you bomb, like you're not getting any pussy. Like, it's just yeah. like, it, it's the fuck like most painful uh, thing up there. I, I have a, <laughs> I have a joke where I, I'm like, look, you guys better laugh because uh, I want to get some tonight for my wife and she's going to, you know, call ahead and ask how I did. <laughs> so say that he was funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, oh, <laughs> I want to get some from my wife. Exactly. Not even, not even a groupie, not even yeah, a right. side piece, man. <laughs> like the woman who I have vowed to love. Like that's the, that's the one. How, but how was the show? It wasn't so good. You better go do the dishes. I got yeah, a headache. Yeah. Yeah, ex- ex- <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but I've, I've always been, I've always been super jealous of, of singers. Like if there was like that, if there was that one wish that I could have from a genie, it would be like, I wish that I could sing. And, and I just wonder like, when, when did you discover that you could sing? Because you had, for one, I, I mean, for those of you who have, for anyone listening who hasn't heard you, like you do have an amazing voice and you also are Thank able you. to do so much with it where you do the growl stuff and the scream stuff and still manage to, after doing that, 
get melodic and all that. So I, I'm jealous. So I'm, I'm just, I'm just wondering, you know, how old were you when you, when you were first like, Hey, you know what? I'm going to start singing. Uh, well, I started, I started in music playing guitar and I'm like, I still play guitar um, badly, but I was 14 years old and I was given a guitar. Um, I used to annoy my neighbors singing Iron Maiden songs badly as a teenager, you know, uh, screaming run to the hills or, or two minutes to midnight at the top of my lungs. Um, and I think if you asked my, my neighbors, they likely would have said, there's no way in hell that he's ever going to be a musician. Um, which is fair because if, if I had heard me back then, I probably would have been like, yeah, you know, but, um, I just started, I started with death metal. Um, I was into the really extreme stuff when I was young. And so I started playing in a band called Perpetual Doom uh, <laughs> and, and doing just the deep back, you know, deep vocals and, and doing background backups because I didn't have a whole lot of idea what I was doing. I was just kind of mimicking what I thought the guys that I looked up to did. And then just, again, mimicking them, I, I started opening my mouth wider. One of the techniques that you have, that you, that you have to do when you're doing like the, the low deep, uh, death metal stuff is you, you keep your mouth pretty closed like this. It's kind of like shaping your, the inside of your mouth, like an egg and, and ooh, you know, uh -huh. and the way that you get a higher pitch out of that is literally just doing the same thing with your vocal cords, but opening your mouth. So like, ooh, ah, you know, it's the same thing according to your vocal cords, but your mouth is actually shaping it. And so that, that's all it did. It was, it was just a, an evolution from there. And then um, I, the band that I was in decided that they wanted to do the uh, corn had come out and they wanted okay. to do new metal stuff. And I was like, no, I want to do death metal. You know, I don't, I don't want to like, rap. I don't want to, I don't want to yeah, do some exactly. half-ass rapping. What the fuck? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, I, I, I liked corn and stuff, but it really struck the rest of the guys in the band. And with me, I was like, no, I want to do that really heavy, extreme stuff. And uh, so, you know, that's what a, that I decided, you know, I, I was going to leave the band and, and there were other bands in our area that were doing stuff, a band called Shadows Fall had just gotten started and they were looking for a guitar, uh, singer and they had me come down and try out and they had some regular singing as well as screaming. And I had the screaming stuff down pat, but I, you know, I wasn't a very good singer at the time. This is in you know, the, like 96 or whatever. I was, I was, I didn't start actually doing any singing until at least seriously trying to sing that, you know, not yelling in, in my bedroom. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, I didn't try and do any serious singing until I was in my twenties. So it was, it was actually, I was a late starter when it came to singing and stuff. So that was the first time that I did. And then it was just a, a matter of, of, you know, practicing and, and, and working on as many different kinds of vocals as I could. And I never really thought about it. I just was like, Oh, I want to try that. I want to try this. And that I think I'm going to take a, a second to make a point. That's one of the things that people need to do more of just try it. I had a friend that wanted to start streaming, uh, on Twitch. And he's like, well, I've got to get this computer and I got to get this and I got to get that. And I got to do this. And I was like, no, you don't. All you got to do is start streaming your Xbox we're freezing again just for a moment hello hello there you're back again you're a little frozen but okay, okay. i could be getting email that happens <laughs> that's right in the, in the so, woods it's like one e yeah. one email is going to throw off everything it could it can it, it really yeah. can it really can um so, uh, yeah. So my friend said, you know, I want to start streaming. And I was like, the only thing you need to do is, is actually start doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, your, your Xbox has the Twitch app in it, start doing it. And that's what I did when I started streaming. I, I didn't really think much about it. I, I knew that I wanted to grab the fill that I wanted to grab the fill that remains. So as soon as I got mm -hmm. the, uh, a, the Twitch app, I grabbed fill that remains and I didn't do anything with it for like a year or a year and change. Um, but then when I decided I wanted to start streaming, I didn't need to buy a bunch of stuff or do anything. I just opened my phone 
and used the app and started streaming and all the other stuff will come. And that's the same thing with anyone else. Uh, my ex-wife was like, I want to learn how to play guitar and blah, blah. And I was like, we'll go buy a guitar. She's like, well, what do I need to do? And dad, I was like, you need to buy a guitar. That's the first thing you need to do. She didn't make that's you buy the- her one. No, no, no. I, this that, is, that, she, that was no. part of the settlement. <laughs> no, no. The, the ex, the, she bought, she wanted to start playing guitar. We're, we're, we're cool. And she wanted okay, to start cool. playing guitar after we divorced and I was able to buy a guitar. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, <laughs> I am buying her nothing. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, but yeah, you, you just start. Don't, say that you want to do this or if you want to start being a photographer and you have an iPhone, don't go talking about the kind of really nice camera that you need to get. Go start taking pictures of things. Mm -hmm. You got an iPhone, you got a phone that's got a camera in it. Go do it. You know, if you want to, if you want to start blogging, do it, start blogging. There's a ton of free stuff and places where you can put free stuff up and, and stuff. Just, you can do it on your Facebook page, which is free. Just start doing it. If you want to start doing podcasts, start doing it. There's a bunch of free apps you can download. The the biggest hindrance to people doing things is almost always themselves. And it's just because they never start. Yeah. Just start. Just do 100%. it. 100%. Yeah. And I, and I, I, I have sort of a, a little bit of, of OCD. So something sure. that, that stopped me from, from doing things is like, well, it's not going to be perfect. So, you know, right, right off the bat, you know, uh, we're recording this and I had to tell myself like, look, look, you're not an audio guy. It's not going to be perfect, but you know, hopefully people are able to, you know, uh, you know, not care so much and just, and be more interested, uh, in the content. But yeah, like the, the That's whole the thing, it's content. Exactly. The content's the important part. Yeah. Um, what was I going to be? I, uh, you know, obviously, uh, COVID has been, you know, had a big effect on, on live performance and all that. Do you have any, any gigs coming up or anything like that? Nope. I, that's one of the, the really cool things about streaming on Twitch is it, it gives me, uh, an outlet for performance. It's not as cool as, as being on stage. Um, but when I get done with my stream, I go shower in my bathroom and I sleep in my bed as opposed to showering in some, you know, in some, some venue and then sleeping in the bunk where, you know, the front lounge might be full of people yelling and screaming and drinking. And and I'm trying to sleep with people yelling and screaming and drinking. And, you know, I get to see my dog every day. And and so it's a give and take. I, I, I prefer playing live. I'm not the biggest fan of touring because Mm -hmm. You're literally, it's 23 hours dedicated to the one hour you're on stage. And so, you know, a lot of that time is spent trying to fill in the blanks, you know, just trying to find something to do. And, um, and so it's not my favorite thing, but I really, 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 really love playing shows. Mm-hmm. Twitch allows me to kind of, you know, it's, it's not, it's like, uh, it's like methadone. <laughs> for uh, for an addict, you know, I, it's not quite the same, but it's cool and it helps me get, you know, get that, get that creative uh, 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 bit out, you know? Yeah. I don't yeah. know if, I don't know if I've, I've become, well, my wife definitely thinks I've become a curmudgeon uh, as a, as, as we've been, we've been together, I think like eight years or something like that. When I was a kid, um, I, I loved like Deftones and Silver Dust um, and Silver Dust. Yeah. And, and bands like that. And, yeah. um, you know, as you get older, you know, your, uh, the scope of music you, you dig also changes. And, yeah. um, when you're, when you're able to see like a great band live, there's nothing like it. But what I've found, yeah. what I've found is when you see a great band live, there are a bunch of people, or at least this might be my case, that seem to just go there to ruin the experience for Lou. <laughs> Dude, so if I could just tell you, if I could just tell you about, about this guy, I don't know if, if <laughs> I, I don't, I, it, danger, Will Robinson, danger, Phil, Will Robinson. Phil, if I go to one of your shows, man, there's going to be like 30 dudes who are just there to be like, fuck that guy, Lou. We're just, and they're not, without even knowing I exist, they're just going to be like that. I um I don't know if you, if you've ever heard of this um uh, the singer of uh, um Glenn Hansard he did um I think his big thing is uh uh the movie Once um and he's uh he's an Irish singer um guitar player and he puts on a fantastic show he's re- like mm-hmm. beautiful really beautiful songs and he's a, he's he's so great live he's so great live that my wife and I we saw him at the Hollywood Bowl 
And then we saw him in New York, at, I think at the Beacon Theater, and never bought his records. Like he was just so good live where it's like, wow, I, don't even yeah. need to, I don't even need to know what, what the songs are. <laughs> and this dude, he, he brought in a, um, an act from, that he met uh, on the road in Ireland. It was just a dude with a, a young kid with a guitar, right? So, you know, like shows start at eight, but you know, you headliners, you don't go on for, for a little while. Yep. Eight o'clock, Glenn Hansard comes out with an acoustic guitar, no mic whatsoever, and starts singing a song like he's a busker, right? <laughs> and then people are like, what the, oh, we got to get in there. So people start yep. coming in, right? He finishes his song and says, the reason why I did this is because I met this young man on the road and I want, all of, I want all of act. you to be here to listen to him play. So then, that is that is an absolute class act. And, and I'm getting like chills, you know, thinking yeah. about it, going back to that. And this kid plays and then Glenn starts and the band sounds great. He's given it all. Like he, at one point he starts walking on the, the there, are chair, there are seats in the bottom. He starts walking on the seats yeah. and stuff, singing. And everybody surrounding him, they take out their phones. Yeah. And it's like, dude, he's right here. He's, he's two inches from your face and you're putting this, this, this roadblock there. Like, put that phone away and just, just be in the moment with that guy. Um, yeah. So. I, you know, I'm of two minds with that. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this goes to why you know, why I have such an affection for libertarian ideas. It's not my place to tell someone how to enjoy a show. I, I'm the performer. And if they want to take out their phone and save that, I'm not in a position to tell them they're wrong. Um, I love, love connecting with fans. Um, one of our songs, uh, there's a song called what if I was nothing. It's a, a, mm -hmm. a, you know, a, a power ballad kind of song. And there's nothing that I love more than finding someone, um, that's singing along. And for the last chorus, I'll jump down and I'll, I'll hold their hand and I'll sing, look them right in the eye and really have a connection, that's you awesome. know, and I love it. I absolutely love it. And the people around that are holding phones and stuff, I don't, I don't begrudge them at all. Um, because it's not my place to tell them how to enjoy it, how to save the moment. Because whereas the person that I'm singing with, um, you know, they're going to remember it and they're sure. going to love it. And, and, you know, I've gotten... I've gotten messages where, you know, I've, people cry when I'm singing, you know, they, that kind of stuff really touches people, you know, but it's only, it's their memory and our memories, you know, our memories aren't, aren't, they're not as, as pure as we'd like to think they are. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't hate on people that, that, uh, that want to pull out their phone. I do understand what you're saying. Um, there, is, there is something to be said about, you know, really being in the moment and not worrying about saving it, a, letting a moment be a moment that does go away. There's something special about that and something that's really, really valuable about that. But at the same time, it's not my place to tell someone, this is how you must enjoy um, the show. Uh, I am up here and I am performing and however you decide to absorb that performance, that's, uh, you know, that's your thing. I, I get it. If, if someone's texting their friends and stuff, that's annoying because they're really not, you know, they're kind of half in it or whatever. So that's like, eh, all right, you're, you're whatever. <laughs> but um, if they're recording, if they're, you know, filming it and, and they want to be able to put it on their YouTube page or put it on their Instagram or whatever, you know be my guest. Uh, you know, I, I'm just thankful that you've come to see the show and that, that you're, you're being a part of it. So I, like I said, I'm, a, I'm of two minds. I can't, I can't hate on people for it. And I, I understand why people would be like, Hey, live in the moment. So. 